All right. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, classifying galaxies and quantum and deep neural networks. Um, and these two topics are sort of case studies on applying uh, deep learning to a practical computer vision <coughs> problem. Uh, and both of these were done in the context of data science competitions on the Kaggle platform. So um, during my PhD, I often let, my get, let myself just get distracted by uh, these competitions. Um, but I ended up doing uh, quite well uh, in some of them. So uh, these are actually two of the winning solutions that I'll be describing. Um, so I'm going to start with galaxies. Um, there's this website called galaxyzoo.org. And on this website, astronomers invite uh, any visitor to help them classify images of galaxies. So um, telescopes are taking millions and millions of images of galaxies. And until recently, astronomers have to go through these manually and annotate them uh, with information about their morphology. So specifically, the shape of the galaxy. Is it a spiral? Is it rounded? How many arms does it have? That kind of stuff. Because astronomers are interested in this information. Um, because it tells them a lot about uh, the physics that are happening uh, in the universe. Um, but obviously it's a bit of a waste of their time to go through these millions of images by themselves. And so they're inviting the public to help, so this is a crowdsourcing platform. Fortunately it turns out there's so many of these images that even crowdsourcing doesn't scale beyond a certain point. So that's where machine learning comes in. Uh, and it's actually nice that they already did this crowdsourcing because now that you have a nice fairly large annotated data set that we can bootstrap our machine learning algorithms with. So if you go through this website, what you see is, um, so you can click the Begin Classifying button, and you'll see something uh, like this. I'll get back to that. Uh, so this is sort of the, the interface. You get an image of an object, and you get asked a question about it. And in this case, it's, it's actually kind of a confusing image because there seem to be two objects in there. Uh, but the one of interest is generally the one in the center of the image. So first we're asked, is this a smooth uh, galaxy or not? It doesn't have features. So let's say that this one is uh, fairly smooth. And then we get the next question. Uh, we said it's smooth and round, so how round is it? I'm going to say this is sort of not really round, not really cigar shaped. This is sort of in between. Uh, and is there anything odd about this galaxy? No. So that's it. So we've answered uh, three questions. Uh, and there's actually 11 of these questions in the field, and they're sort of organized in this decision tree. And the questions you get asked obviously depend on the answers that you get on previous questions. Uh, so this question, how rounded is it, only really makes sense if you said that it was a round, rounded galaxy in the first place. So um, each individual that classifies an image takes a path through this tree. Uh, and then when, say, 40 or 50 people uh, have done this for a given image, we can aggregate all of their answers into a sort of probability distribution across all these different questions. Um, and the goal of the competition on Kaggle was actually to go and predict these probabilities uh, from the pixels. Um, yeah, that's basically what I just said. Um, so in practice, what this problem looked like for competition participants uh, was as follows. So we got 140,000 JPEG color images of galaxies. Each one was 424 by 424 pixels. So um, if you're familiar with uh, convents in general, you know that these are actually quite big images to, to process with convents. So I'll explain later how uh, I dealt with that. About 60,000 of these images uh, had the probabilities, the answer probabilities provided. So these were our labeled data that we could use to train the models. And then the uh, remaining images uh, were the ones that we were supposed to generate uh, predictions for, and those were the images on which uh, the competition, uh, on which our, our performance was judged. Uh, the solution that I came up with is based around this uh, seven-layer content. This was back in 2014, so back then a seven-layer content was still deep. Uh, that's not no longer really the case. Um, it's sort of, it was sort of inspired by Alex that you, might, you may sort of recognize the, the shape. And um, for the next 10 or so minutes, I'm going to go from the input side to the output side and sort of explain everything that was special about this particular content. So we're going to start with pre-processing and talk about how the images are fed into this network, um, what, the, what the different parts sort of look like, 
And then at the output side, uh, there's, there's going to be some post-processing uh, as well. So first of all, pre-processing. As I said, these images are huge. Uh, and that would considerably slow down uh, training these networks. So the first thing I did was notice that actually in most of these images, uh, they're mostly black. There's mostly the void of space, and then there's an object in the middle. And actually, we can just cut off 75% uh, of the image uh, and just operate on this middle part, and that works fine. So that's already saving us a lot of computation. And then another thing we can do is take this uh, cropped image and downscale it by a factor of three. And this is something I did initially at the start of the competition, because in these data science competitions, it's really important to be able to iterate fast. So I figured I'd start with small images and then later increase the resolution uh, when I sort of settled on an architecture. And I tried that and it didn't help. So it turns out that you can get away with downsampling these images by factor three and still get really good results. Uh, there was also an optional pre-processing step that I tried out and I ended up not using it for my main models, but I did use it for some. Uh, other models that I sort of blended into an ensemble to create some diversity. Uh, and that was uh, to recenter and rescale the images first because a small percentage of the images didn't actually have the galaxy in the very middle of the image, like this one for example. So if you then do the, the scaling and cropping as I explained before, you basically chop off part of the galaxy. So I found a way to uh, identify the, the salient object in each image and uh, recenter it. Uh, on this object so that we can always crop uh, the object itself. Um, and uh, the same thing for scaling. So there's a few images where the galaxy is a lot bigger than, than just the, the center part of the image, like this one, for example. So if we crop that, we're actually cropping off a lot of uh, useful information. So I also uh, found a way to do scale estimation and then rescale the images to be sort of the same scale. And the way I did this was I used this tool that astronomers actually used to do this called Source Extractor. Source Extractor takes images and identifies astronomical objects uh, and it provides their centroids and also their uh, radii, so it's sort of an estimate of the size. Um, there were a bunch of different radii that I could extract and I tried all of them and found that the Petrosian radius was a good sort of estimate of the size. Uh, I don't actually know what the physical interpretation of the Petrosian radius is, but uh, that worked best, so that's what I used. Um, one thing about Source Extractor is that it sort of finds all the objects in the images. So as you can see, it's circling a lot of stuff that we're not interested in, so I had to come up with a bit of a heuristic to find the, the salient object in the middle there. Uh, after these pre-processing steps, there was a lot of data augmentation involved, uh, because 60,000 images is not really a lot to, <coughs> to train a combat on. Um, so, um, I perturbed the training images in various ways. And the nice thing about galaxies, uh, images of galaxies, is that there's no, no real uh, notion of up and down in space. So that means you can randomly rotate these images and create a lot more training data. Because obviously when we rotate this galaxy, it's still the same galaxy. So the, the predictive probabilities should be the same. Um, but to a continent, uh, this new rotated image will look completely different because all the pixels are in different places and, and oriented differently. Uh, so we can do rotation, but we can also uh, do a little bit of translation, not too much because we're going to keep the, the galaxy in the center. Uh, we can rescale it a little bit. Um, we can flip it, and we can also jitter the brightness and contrast. Um, so after the pre-processing and the data augmentation, the images were fed into the convolutional part of the network. So this is just a stack of a bunch of convolutional and pooling layers, uh, which I'm assuming you're all sort of familiar with. Uh, apologies if you aren't. Um, one thing to note here is that the input of this part of the network is 45 by 45 pixels. And I actually said earlier that I was rescaling to, uh, by factor three to 69 by 69. So there's something uh, else going on here, and I'll explain that in a bit. Um, we have the images coming on the left, and then there's uh, a few convolutional layers alternating with max pooling layers, which aren't shown here, but I've indicated them uh, in text. Uh, there's four convolutional layers in total, total so not particularly deep by modern standards. Um, and then I sort of modified this part of the network to incorporate the fact that these images have rotation invariance properties. So instead of uh, extracting just one 
crops from the from the original image and applying the content to that. I actually extracted multiple crops, so we have this original one. I also extracted one at an angle uh, of 45 degrees, and this sort of provides a different viewpoint of the same galaxy. And then we can uh, flip both of these to get two more. So now we have four different viewpoints of the same galaxy that we can process with the same stack of layers. Uh, and I actually took this one step further because for each image, we can split it up uh, into four overlapping parts. So we can take the uh, top left corner, top right, bottom right, uh, bottom left, like this. Uh, and we always sort of include the, the center of the galaxy because it's a very important part of the image, it turns out. So this actually gives us a lot of information. And then we take all of these four and we uh, rotate them to uh, align them. And then we have, in total, we have 16 of these smaller 45 by 45 pixel images where the center of the galaxy uh, is in the bottom right corner. And these all provide sort of different viewpoints of the same objects. But they all sort of have the same statistics, right? Because the galaxy is oriented in the same way. So we can process all of these with the same stack of uh, convolutional layers. And then at the output of this stack, we're going to get 16 different feature representations for the same galaxy. And we can just concatenate those to give the rest of the network a lot more information to work with. So we're actually, in the convolutional part of the network, we're doing 16-way parameter sharing across different orientations uh, of the input image. And so that's what this time 16 at the bottom <coughs> means that you may have spotted uh, initially in the, when, when I showed the architecture. So basically, this stack is applied uh, 16 times to different orientations. And then we get uh, different feature representations. We just concatenate them. And those are fed into the dense part of the network. So there's a few dense <coughs> uh, stacked on top of that. Um, and then uh, the output layer is a layer is a linear layer that um, provides 37 uh, numbers, and these are going to be converted into the uh, probabilities that we have to predict. But it turns out that these probabilities adhere to certain constraints. So um, the probabilities of the answers to the question, how rounded is it, should add up to the probability of the answer that this is a rounded galaxy, right? Because this is the only way that this question could be asked. And all the uh, answer probabilities in this tree sort of follow these constraints, like the probability should always add up to the previous answer. Um, and we can actually explicitly incorporate this into the network so that its predictions always adhere to these constraints. And I did that as follows. So first I have this linear layer that provides me with 37 real numbers. Then I apply uh, rectification, so this is just a, a value basically. So I get 37 positive numbers because as you know probabilities are usually positive. Um, and then I normalize it. Uh, these per question to get an actual multinomial distribution per question. And this is sort of a conditional distribution. Given that this question is asked, what is the distribution of the answers? And then to get the final probabilities, you just have to do some multiplications with the, with the probabilities of the preceding answers. And then these probabilities will adhere to the output constraints. Um, so that's sort of the, the pre-processing and the network. And then there was a bunch of post-processing involved as well. So the first is model averaging. In, in these data science competitions, one thing you cannot avoid is to average a bunch of different models together, because this will almost always uh, give you a performance boost. So I did that in a couple different ways. Uh, the first is uh, averaging across different architectures. So this is sort of the base architecture that I based all my work on. Um, and then there's a few variants of this. For example, there was a network that had a couple more features in the top layer. There was a network that had only one dense layer. Um, there was a network with values in the dense layer instead of max out. Um, <coughs> uh, what else? Oh, yeah. Different filter sizes. There's a, there, there were a bunch of these, about 17 in total. Um, and they all sort of have slightly different biases. So averaging their predictions together actually gives you then another way to do averaging is across different transformations of the input. So I already showed that we sort of made the network uh, aware of the rotational invariance pro properties of these images, but we can actually also just feed it multiple rotated copies of the original image and generate predictions and then average them together. And um, I specifically did this with 10 rotations uh, offset by 36 degrees each so that none of these rotations would align with the 45 degree and the 90 degree angles that the network already sort of incorporates. So this is another layer of, of uh, exploiting rotation invariance, basically. 
then we can also add uh, a bunch of different zoom levels, and we can either flip or not flip the images, and we get 60 different uh, copies of the same image that we generate predictions for, then we average them uh, across these transformations. So we're averaging across 60 transformations times 17 different models in total. So that's a uh, lot of different um, opinions, basically. Um, so to give sort of an overview of the different things that I did during this competition to reduce overfitting, because that was really the key here. The data set is quite small. It was just really just finding new ways to reduce overfitting and then using that to scale up the models further and it's sort of an, an endless cycle. Um, so data augmentation was obviously crucial here. The, the rotation invariance uh, proved to be key. Uh, but also incorporating this property into the architecture helped a lot because of the parameter share, which is also sort of a, a regularizer. Uh, model averaging also uh, tends to help for this. So even if you have a model that slightly overfits, if you then throw that into an ensemble, it can still be very helpful. Um, I, in the dense part of the network, I use dropout, which is sort of a uh, very common thing to do nowadays. And then uh, note that batch norm hadn't been invented yet, so I didn't use that. <laughs> uh, and then in the dense layers, I also use max out, so I didn't really touch on this before. I used max out to uh, sort of reduce the size of the representation, but still have fairly powerful units. So basically, in, in the case of max out, what you do is you, instead of uh, applying a ReLU, you take the maximum of two different units. Uh, and basically, each unit now has two parameters, so it has more um, expressivity. But the next layer um, still sees the same number of units. So it's sort of a way to more gradually increase the number of parameters uh, in the model. Uh, training these things requires GPU acceleration. So this is the hardware uh, that I had access to in my lab at the time. We had a bunch of GTX 680s. Um, uh, I used the piano library to implement all of these networks. And then for the, the data augmentation and pre-processing, I used a library called Scikit Image, which is really nice. Uh, and this allowed me to do the, the pre-processing and data augmentation in real time. So during training, I would generate fresh batches of training data. Uh, with random perturbations in real time, which basically allowed me to uh, give the network new data constantly. So it never basically see the exact same image twice, which helped a lot uh, against overfitting. All right, uh, let's take a quick look at uh, what this network actually learns. So these are the photos in the first convolutional layer. It's always nice to visualize these. Uh, you can sort of see that they, they, they look like edges but they're, also, they're sort of more rounded in a way, which makes sense because of the rotational environment properties of the images. Um, we can also look at the activations in different layers for a bunch of different images. And then you see that, as expected, it sort of preserves the spatial structure uh, all the way up into layer three. And then at the end, you sort of get a, a fairly sparse representation of the image. And uh, as I mentioned before, we get, we get basically 16 of these that are concatenated and fed into the dense layers. A few more examples. Um, but in the interest of time, I will sort of run through them. Uh, this is a slightly different visualization where we're looking at units in the topmost hidden <coughs> layer of the network. So the layer before the output layer with 2048 max out units. And uh, what we're looking at here is we're finding images in the test set that maximally and minimally activate these units. Because they're max out units, they have sort of two sides. We can look at both the maximal activation and the minimal activation. Uh, which is not something you can really do with a ReLU because it saturates it at zero. Um, so each group of 12 images represents a single unit, and the top six images are the maximally activating ones, and the bottom six are minimally activating. So that allows us to see what the units are sort of discriminating between. So you see that they learned uh, a bit of rotation invariance here. Uh, I can have a couple more examples here as well. And there's one particularly interesting one um, so this top one here, if you look at the minimally activating uh, images for that one, they all have this black line across them. And this is obviously not a, a morphological property of the galaxy, it's, a, it's an imaging artifact, right? It's, it's the edge of the, the CCD sensor, basically. Uh, but it turns out that on the Galaxy Zoo website, uh, people tend to classify these as disturbed galaxies. Uh, and that is not actually what a disturbed galaxy is, but it turns out that the icon on the website sort of looks like it has this black line. It. So this was basically a poor design choice on their part. 
Uh, and of course now it's in the data set, so then the model is going to try and reproduce it. So it actually learned features to detect these black lines uh, across the image. Um, a couple more of these. And then, yeah, I have another visualization here of um, predictions versus uh, ground truth. So blue is ground truth, red is prediction, so this is an easy one. There's also images like this in the data set that it's never seen before, so this one doesn't have, even have a black background, so then it gets very confused, same here. Um, this one is really hard and I don't really understand why. I think maybe because it's very faint. Uh, and then here's another really easy one. Okay, I have five minutes left, I think, so uh, I'm going to move on to plankton, but it's yeah, sort of the same thing, but different. Uh, so there's a blog post uh, where I uh, describe all of this stuff uh, in detail, and also the, the code for the competition is available on GitHub, so you can uh, play with that as well if you want. Uh, so next up is Plankton, uh, and I only have five minutes left, but that's actually fine because a lot of this followed the same sort of patterns uh, as the Galaxy challenge, uh, because it turns out that these images share a lot of properties with images of galaxies. They also have this rotation invariance property. So I'm just going to highlight a few things that we did in addition to all the stuff that uh, I did uh, for Galaxies originally. Um, so this was a team effort. We did this with a group of seven people, this competition. Uh, in our lab to sort of uh, allow the people who are less familiar with deep learning to uh, learn uh, from those who are more familiar and to sort of work on a practical uh, problem together. Um, the context of this competition is that marine biologists want to know which species of plankton are in which parts of the ocean because this tells them a lot about the health of the ecosystem there. So uh, the way they do this is they go out on a boat with a special camera that they drag to the water, they take a lot of pictures, and then they basically just stare at these pictures and try to identify the different species. So that, that second part is something uh, we can automate with uh, deep learning, save them some time. Uh, in the context of the competition, the problem looked like this. So we got a bunch of images. Note here that they're all different sizes. So the size of the image actually reflects the size of the, the creature in, in reality, which is sort of uh, interesting. Um, there were 30,000 images that were labeled, so these we could use for training, across 121 different species. So, uh, and the, the distribution was sort of uneven, so for some classes we only had maybe 20 training images, so this was quite challenging. Uh, and then 130,000 images uh, for evaluation. Uh, again, pre-processing and data augmentation um, was sort of the same as before. The main difference is that we actually started by rescaling all the images to be the same size, because it's nice if can feed same size images to a content. So we're actually throwing away a little bit of information here, and I'll explain in a bit how we get that back in there. And then the augmentation is sort of the same as before, zooming, rotation, translation, flipping, uh, sharing, and stretching. Uh, for this competition, our network architectures were based on the Oxford Net, so we only had three by three convolutions, uh, alternating with pooling layers, um, and then a bunch of common connected layers at the top. So this one has 10 convolutional layers and four pooling layers one of the architectures that we, that we used. Um, but of course, again, there were a lot of variants of this. Uh, one thing that we did was sort of extend the rotation variance incorporation idea. And here we actually really went for a complete invariance. So we actually had uh, multiple rotated copies of our images pass through the same network. And then uh, between the dense layers, we inserted this pooling layer to pool across these different orientations. So we get true invariance against the rotations of uh, 90 degrees. Um, and this is really easy to do. You basically define this layer that makes copies of your images and stacks them in the batch dimension. Uh, and we call that a slicing layer. And you sort of insert it at the start of your network. And then you also have a pooling layer that recombines these uh, different feature representations of the images at the end there. Um, and then once you're doing this, you're basically processing the images at, across four different uh, sort of information pathways, and we found a way to share information between these pathways. So you can actually make copies of the feature maps between these pathways and get four-way parameter sharing. I'm not going to explain this in detail. Uh, there's, a, there's a paper on, uh, on this actually now um, that was published at ICML this year. Um, and what it basically allows you to do is, this is equivalent to applying each of the filters in your network in four different orientations. So you're, you get four-way parameter sharing with this, but you still get full invariance. Um, then in terms of 
post-processing, one thing we found interesting was to um, use, uh, reuse our test set to create more training data, which is usually sort of ch cheating, but in the context of Kaggle competitions, you can do that because they have to give you the test data. Uh, so we actually generated labels for our test data by combining our best models up to that point, and then use those labels uh, to uh, train um, bigger networks. So you could sort of combine test data and train data into uh, your batches. Uh, I'm going to have to wrap up. So um, we also ended up incorporating some traditional computer vision features. And the reason this helps here is because we're actually removing information by rescaling all the images to be the same size. Basically, putting it back in at the dense layers along with some different features uh, turned out to, to help a little bit. And then the model averaging story is sort of the same as with uh, Galaxy. So, ensembling, test time augmentation, um, so averaging cross multiple transformations. And then one other thing here we did here was bagging. So, we trained the same model on multiple different subsets, 90% <coughs> subsets of the training data, and averaged the results, and that also gave us a slight boost. Uh, software and hardware, the same thing. So we had a few more GPUs in the meantime. Uh, we used Tiano and the Lasagna library. And if you want to know more about this, there's a blog post about this as well. The code is available on GitHub. And these are some more coordinates uh, of myself and my lab mates at the time. And that's it. Thank you very much.